Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it is posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access our archives. Both the live show and the recording are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you who may be joining us not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the, state's, is the state library for Nebraska. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find topics on our show for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, museums, archives, corrections, uh, anything, anything and everything. Really our only criteria that it's something to do with libraries. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products. Um, it really runs the gamut of the kind of things we have on the show. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers sometimes from um, across the state, across the country, actually. Uh, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that talk about programs that we have here at the commission or about things that we think would be of interest to anybody. And today, that's what we have with it. That's what we're doing today. <laughs> um, Amanda Sweet is here with us. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. So anything techie, that's her. And we are today, um, this is the Teaching Tech in the Library series that Amanda has been doing for us. And we are on part three today, uh, part one and two all happened last month and the recordings of both of those sessions are on our in our archives uh, who is learning and why and how do people learn so if you want to you can watch those recordings and part four is coming up at the end of this month on june 30th wait july july 28th sorry wrong calendar july 28th uh, and that will be marketing and follow-up um, but today amanda's going to talk about partnerships preparing it with staff and training. So I'll hand it over to you, Amanda, take it away. Cool. So as Krista said, we've been working on this series for about, yeah, this is our third one. And so this is kind of like a living learning course. Um, the main feedback that I've gotten is I need this information, I need it right now. So I don't have time to make everything pretty before I put it out there. So, yeah. so what I'm going to do, now, yeah. <laughs> so here's what I'll do is I'm going to cover some course updates for what I've changed so far, because as I put this stuff out in the weeks after it and throughout the series, I do make updates to that course, prettify things and change things up a little bit. I've added some graphics, I've changed things over to a card format. And I'll go over some of what you can expect for the changes that have happened, what's coming up soon. And basically, I put the information out there and then I make it easier to digest and add some better visuals, graphics, learning tools as I go along. Basically, as I have time, I make it better. And this is also kind of a way to show that instruction is pro is progressive it iterates it grows what i'm doing now you're probably going to find yourself doing in the future if you don't already many of you probably do and so then i'll go over so i talked about um, user experience design in a previous session and i've actually done quite a few user experience research materials for this project so i'll go over some of the findings because that's probably going to be relevant to what you're actually going to be putting together, how much time you have for partnerships, where you're going to fit in staff training and what works for you. So I'll kind of cover over the important bits of that. And one of the tools that I found most useful in making design decisions. And then I'll go over some of, um, some of the partnership basics. If you are completely new to partnerships, I'll go over the resources and frameworks that I found and the framework that I adapted for use in this course. 
Um, partnerships is not something that I have done extensively, so I relied heavily on what others have done before me. So that's kind of one of those things that it's just better to use the frameworks of the organizations that have been there and done that 8 million times. Um, what I have done more of is staff training. In my life before libraries, I actually worked in, um, I was kind of a, an administrative assistant and I was an interim manager for a year doing training. So I actually had to find the time to actually do that training to help people gain those new skills and figure out what's next and start making those agreements to learn these skills. Why am I learning this? Why is it relevant? How is this fitting into my work life? And how can I translate this over to multitask into my regular life? And so that is more of what I've done in the past. If you want to know my background and how and why I'm covering it. So let's just dig into it. So the first thing I'll go over is my course updates. So let me actually open up the course. And I will put this link into the chat just in case you don't have it handy. And you should see that popping in now. So some of the things that I've added are converting these text sections over into cards. So this card format is actually really easy to do, whether you're using WordPress or in this case, I actually hand coded it. So it's just something that kind of breaks up the page visually, updates it, makes it look better. I added some additional visual tools so that you can process information better. This used to actually just be a standard bulleted list, but it's been converted over into a graphic. That graphic is just something that I made in Canva. Um, most mm -hmm. of the graphics I do are in Canva just because Canva makes life easier. <laughs> and you'll start to see some of these little graphics starting to pop in here. And a lot of these bullet, bulleted lists are being turned into worksheets. So these worksheets, you'll start to see examples of them in this section here. So this is another infographic that used to be a list. Now it's an actual visual. It'll start to give you a better idea of how to interpret and translate that information. And if you're trying to wonder how you're going to implement this in the library itself, if you are creating learning materials and resources and you don't have a whole ton of time, you can actually just put the material out, use the standard bulleted list or the text format, and then maybe a couple weeks or a month later, start adding this stuff in incrementally, which is basically what I'm doing now. And another thing that I started adding are these worksheets. So this will start making it easier to kind of break the information down and just use these as kind of a planning tool or a um, basically something to make life easier. And so these have been starting to be embedded in here and these are going to be reformatted pretty soon. So it's just kind of one of those all things take time, but it'll mm -hmm. get there. I think it's good to see this, um, if people have been joining us for this series since the beginning, seeing how things can change. And it shows like how you come up with a concept for teaching anything. And it really probably is that kind of brainstorming, bulleted lists, or I wrote up a paragraph or two, and now how do I make it usable? And we can see how that changes over time and how that actually works. Yeah. And as a side note, this process will look different for each different library because some libraries actually have a marketing and design team that's able to do this separately. So Lucky. if you have a right, yeah. You know? <laughs> so if you are a if you're working on your own like me, then you can start doing something like this. If you are breaking the instructional design process out and in, into different team roles, you might have one person who is writing the actual content, one person who is prettifying everything and putting it into a website or a learning management system. Then you might have even another person who's doing graphics. And you might even be able to recruit like a local student or volunteer who wants to start learning this and getting some um, experience under the belt. And so you can start making a plan for this and then say, 
and go to a graphics team or an education department in a local university and say, can you make these graphics for me? Do you want to get some experience actually doing this stuff out in the world? And that's another way to do it. So I told you the course updates here, but I should also tell, give kind of a brief recap of what these different sections are, just in case you are new to this series. Um, if you do want to run through this course, you'll start with kind of understanding who is learning this material and why it actually matters to them. This is the background of um, user experience research, and I borrowed some influence from local startup companies because startups are actually they're low on staff, low on resources. They just want to test out ideas and make sure that they're going in the right direction. And that's basically what libraries want to do too. So I started incorporating a lot of those startup mechanisms into design. And user experience has already infiltrated libraries. It's already a thing, but it's starting to grow even more into it. So you'll kind of gain access to a lot of the tools and resources for understanding why people do the things they do and how to translate it into a library service. And then this is um, the what's the problem section is a way to, after you understand what motivates people to do the things they do, You'll understand the different things that people are facing and what actually gets prioritized. Because you might put together a workshop for local parents, or you might put together a workshop for learning Facebook, and then nobody shows up. And usually, if you did a survey to find out what people want and they just say Facebook, then they may have cared about Facebook six months ago, but their priorities may have changed by the time you actually did the thing. So that could be a contributing reason as to why they're just not doing it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the how do people learn will expand your different options for how to connect people to the information and resources they need in the library. I have a little menu of options that you can start brainstorming with and start to use as a planning guide and a tool. So the how do people learn is basically comparing against where people are sitting when they actually learn the information and where people are sitting when they use the information and finding out if those two are stacking up. Because if you are, that's one of the biggest complaints that people have against classroom study is how is this going to be relevant? I just learned this little scattered little assortment of stuff. Why should I care? Mm -hmm. And the gather the resources is once you've started to understand how people learn, you have kind of a litmus test of what you're actually looking for. Then you can shift over into finding people who are able to help. Because if you're going to start finding partners, you need to have a really good solid idea of what you actually want. You can't just walk into a small business or walk into the American Job Center and say, you know, someone told me that they kind of maybe want to do this. And do you think you can maybe sort of do this? And people are going to be like, what are you talking about right now? So we're actually in this session now, we're going to go over some different startup method tools that people have used to build a pitch deck. Um, if you've gone to the Computers and Libraries Conference, you may have actually seen pitch decks in use. It's a way to organize and concentrate your focus on a single idea so that you're able to articulate it and communicate it to people who might be able to help or people who actually want to attend the project or attend the program. So in the course itself, I haven't prettified it yet. We've gone over this, but I've given some resources for how to build those startup pitch decks. There's some examples of what a pitch deck looks like and how you can start using this tool for yourself so that you don't sound absolutely ridiculous when you're actually reaching out to people. <laughs> and you'll also learn what is the process of actually building a partnership? What does this look like? If you're new to it, you haven't done it before, um, that's, I made like a little infographic just as a reference point so that you're not pulling out your hair when you're doing it. And the second half of this webinar itself is going to be once you've figured out who you're actually going to be working with. Do you even need an official partner? 
or can you just connect people over? Are you going to do a warm handoff? And then once you've figured that out, you can start figuring out what your staff actually needs to know. And that's where that UX research is going to come in handy that I will go over now. Um, our last session is just going to be about how do you let people know this exists and how do you track this so that people, so that you can justify to a library board that this thing worked or this thing didn't work. This is what I'm going to do differently. This is how I'm going to pivot, change, test, what do you do next? So the first thing that you actually want to know, our goal in this is figuring out what do people care about? So you'll see that this little visual graphic is everything is centered on just living. Mm -hmm. And then these little circles on the outside here are going to be how important this topic is to people at that time. So while people are actually upskilling, trying to change careers, trying to figure out what's next, or they just graduated from college or something, this bubble might be bigger. And then they have little sub problems that go out after it. And then they might be trying to figure out what they want to do in life. What's it all for? It might get very melodramatic very quickly. And <laughs> so this will be like a little smaller bubble. And then their family, they might have parents that are going into elder care. They might have younger children that they are still trying to figure out how to be parents and how to do their adulting. And or they might be trying to figure out dating, whatever it is that may be. This is what the library wants to know. This is what is important. This is what is going to focus your energy and which program is going to be going on right now. Where do you put your energy? What matters to people? The problem is that the user experience research that I put together for um, small to mid-sized libraries makes it very difficult to actually run through and find time to do the studies that will give you these answers. And that's actually part of what I want to help with in the Library Commission is how much of this can, of this legwork is just repetitive. How many different demographics and categories can be researched ahead of time without doing a whole bunch of this stuff individually? How many resources can be made available so that the risk of research is reduced. So you can have a series of options to pull from without sacrificing your own time and energy. So this is how you would actually condense something into an actual feasible thing. Um, this is a one sentence pitch that's um, adapted out of the Founders Institute. This is how you would translate what matters to people and pick a little mini sub problem and start to zero in focus onto it. And this is how you're going to start articulating ideas to people who might be able to help, to your board members, or to anyone you need to explain this project to or get approval from. So it's basically, and there are some examples of how this actually works um, in the course itself. So let me go and find, there it is. So the barriers that we have as actual library staff and putting this all together, I put together in a persona. So this is you. If you if you read it and you say that I'm completely off, let me know. I can fix that. But if you read it and say, yep, that's right on the money, then I guess I did my job well. <laughs> So from what I've done, I've talked to a lot of library staff, like it's either been through maker spaces over the phone or just during different events that I've attended and various different conferences, a bunch of different places. And I started taking notes and aggregating them into this persona. Personas are basically a description of a demographic. In your own library, you might put to put this together for an aging population, recent retirees, recent college graduates, um, new parents, uh, parents of teens, um, confused parents with technology, pretty much any demographic that you can think of, you can put this together to start guiding your decisions and start guiding your materials. 
So it's basically turtles all the way down. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I had to use design to make this course. You'll be using this design to make your courses. And this is also going to be the information that and the barriers that are going to get in the way when you were trying to actually build partnerships and trying to um, do staff training. Because if you have library staff that are working multiple jobs and you have people that are, um, whenever they do learning, they have to focus on courses for CE credit because they, that's what it takes to be a librarian, then it's going to kind of take away from other learning. So that's something that I have to, that has to be changed um, for requirements for CE and it may also have to be changed as a priority within the library itself. So it's basically, if your goal is to expand library services and to meet actual needs, these are your barriers, and you know what you actually have to learn to reach that goal, it's changing priorities and tracking time. All right, so let me dig, it's 1025, mm -hmm. and I'm going to dig into partnerships. So this is a quick infographic that I put together that is based on, uh, it's a Young Adult Library Services Association to build partnerships. Hmm. So a lot of this stuff that I put together is hmm. based on this type of framework, because as we just talked about in my library, my small to medium sized library persona, you're not going to have a lot of time to actually put all this stuff together yourself. You're going to need to rely on partnerships to be able to fill in the gaps. Or you might be able to find um, online or local resources that you can do a warm handoff for. So when you are building those partnerships, you might not actually have a whole ton of time to do it. If you are fo if you are only part time, you're juggling a part time job at the local grocery store, or you're juggling a part time job elsewhere, and you're also trying to keep track of all your family obligations, partnerships can kind of fall by the wayside. So it's more or less about finding <clears throat> small incremental time to start building these relationships and finding out not only how the library can, who the library can work with, but how you can contribute to their organization as well. Um, I will pull up an exercise that I did in a workshop where I asked people, if you want to start doing a um, resources for small business owners, or you want to do resources for people who are trying to get a job, who would you actually work with? Um, before you can actually start building par uh, building partnerships, you have to know who you're going to partner with. If you only have a limited amount of time, you have to start prioritizing which of those partners to focus in on. And you have to have like a little backup list just in case that falls through. And you can also start um, building like a, an incremental partnership system so that instead of building an official long-term partnership, you can start with something unofficial mini pilot program and work your way up to start building that trust so that you don't have to devote as much time and energy to that relationship to be able to create a program or make connections or do what you need to do. And so this, I'm not gonna go into every single little bit of this because a lot of this you can just read and if you're interested in learning partnerships, you'll probably just go to the website. And so let's talk about how you can actually start brainstorming who to partner with and when. So in a previous section of this course, in the what's the problem section, I will have asked you to make focus onto one single problem. That's where that pitch deck came in, where you were starting to zero and narrow down focus. If you chose career changers, which is a really common one right now, I will have asked you to break that down into separate little sub problems. What are the smaller things that people need to be able to solve and address to be able to solve this major problem? So this is where this visual diagram comes in. 
you would put your major section topic in the center and then break out these different little subtopics. And then you can break this down into one more layer saying, who are the people that are working locally, regionally, or nationally who are going to be able to help me with this subtopic? So the most common ones for skill building are job centers. There can be online, re um, online learning like Coursera, LinkedIn, or different things like that. And if you go with the online learning resources like LinkedIn, they can be costly, but you can also find low cost alternatives. And that is also a low maintenance partnership option because it's not official. You just sign up for it, but you are gaining resources from an external source. So it is still technically a partnership because you don't actually have to do this stuff yourself. So as you start breaking this down into topics, you'll start to see that a lot of these little subtopics, they overlap. Job centers help with the interview and test, but they also help with skill building. And then you can see tech training that's popping up pretty much everywhere. And you can start seeing that once you've broken this down and start seeing the patterns between who, like what is addressed, you find out that in even when you are trying to tackle four smaller subtopics, you don't actually need four separate partners. You might actually find out that there's one that can do it all, or you might find out that you only need two people to solve two major um, two people to solve four major clusters. So just laying this out visually like this can help you kind of organize what is most important. And I can see it could uh, re um, relieve a lot of stress when you're thinking about, I have this big thing I wanna do, but there's so much. You know, basically, breaking yeah. down into these, <clears throat> excuse me, breaking it down into these small bits is so much easier to work with mentally. <laughs> yeah, you know. And so once you've identified it, you can pop into the framework to start making that initial connection, whether it's over a, an email, you can go to a local chamber of commerce event. Um, a, a lot of these tech training places, they also hold open houses. So if you go to one of their open houses, just go to the webinar and after it, they'll usually say, reach out to me if you want to do blah, blah, blah. Just reach out to them. And most of these people, they want to work with you because you're going to be sending a business, you're going to be sending them people, you're going to be making connections. So once you've identified these partners, start making a list of how you can actually help them. Because if you just say, can you give me some tech training? They're going to be like, we already do that. Why should we do that through you? And that's when it starts to that's when you can start making your justification system and start practicing talking about it in the library to friends, family, and just start practice saying it before you actually connect with people. And so this is where asset mapping comes in. Um, a lot of you probably already do this. Um, there are some resources that are available in the course if you haven't already done it. Um, I want to get into the skills training, so I'm just going to skip over this because, well, it's in the, it's written down already. You'll be fine. So once you've actually started figuring out who you're going to be working with, you'll want to start figuring out what you actually need to do in the library itself. What is the library's role? What are you bringing to the table? How can you make sure that it gets done and you fulfill your promises that you've made during the partnership phase? So that is why I put together the, so you'll see this in the how do people learn section in a previous section of the course. Uh, let me click this open. So, and I'll make it bigger. So this section is about how people actually learn in the library. What are the different resources, materials, and common things that the library actually does? And how do you plan for them? So some of those most common ones, commu um, community conversations are incredib incredibly popular right now. And so are workshops, trainings. If you're new to this, or if you're trying to find a different way to do it, you can use this as kind of a guide tool. 
uh, when you go down to any one of these different sections, there'll be a mini guide for how to actually do it. And most of them will also have a planning checklist. This planning checklist is going to help you actually break things down into smaller subtopics to make sure that you covered everything. And it's going to kind of make sure that, well, your head doesn't explode when you're trying to figure everything out. So it's kind of your quick start cheat sheet to make sure that everything gets done. And so a lot of these are going to be opened out into um, pre-made charts that you can customize and adapt based on your actual goal. So it'll be separated out into task. And so you want people to be able to sign up for it. You wanna make sure that you've done the marketing materials and you want to break out things for when this stuff is actually going to get done, who's doing it, when you're going to start this section, and basically how are you going to make sure that this actually got done. And if this little Gantt chart or this planning chart doesn't exist in this format for every single one, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's just a guide that you would wanna customize based on what you actually wanna do, but it's really easy to just make this kind of chart just by breaking it down into task, who done it, who's doing it, how um, how important is it to actually get done? If we don't do this, can we skip it? And whatever is important to your library, add it in and start tracking it. So let me close this out. I'm going to clean up my system, my screen here. And you can just kind of pick what you actually need out of here and use this for planning. So I'm going to hop back into my slides here. And so all of the stuff, the tasks that are broken down from that chart that you will put together, you're gonna need probably some time to actually learn and build those new skills. And that is where staff preparation and training comes in handy. And this is more of what I've done. Um, the partnerships, I relied heavily on what other people have done just because, well, they're better at it. And so this is something that is more my forte. And the first thing is actually finding time to do stuff. So in small and medium-sized libraries, it's basically about tracking where you actually are spending your time, finding out what's important and changing habits. Because a lot of times in smaller libraries, people may have just gotten used to doing the same thing over and over again. And that's not even just true just in libraries, that's true in everywhere. And that's why James Clear made Atomic Habits. It's because you need to find ways to do things differently if you're going to get things done. And if you have never even looked at technology, never looked at training, never looked at um, learning Excel or learning anything like that, and you start finding out that this is a thing that is actually necessary now, and you're not used to building this into your schedule, habits need to change. And that's also going to be part of the mindset and mentality of people who are learning and people who are actually tracking whether people learn the stuff. So these resources I put in there for that purpose. It's going to get you into that mindset, kind of start getting into that framework that says, I need to do this. This is important to me and my community right now. If I don't do this, my town is going to be unprepared and people aren't going to have access to the tools, information and resources that are going to let them live. If I don't do this, if I don't change my habits, what'll happen. And so when you start doing that, you actually want, you might wanna start tracking what your day looks like. Where does your time actually do, where does your time actually go? And I put together a mini activity that's based on these resources and based on what I've done when I actually help people do training, started planning this out. But, and I will admit 
that tracking your daily tasks for a week or a month or the duration that you're going to be doing this training can be tedious. It just, it can be. <laughs> but it was actually also incredibly helpful. And it's because we tell ourselves a million and one times that this tutorial, it says that it's a minute and 30 second long video. This task is only going to take me five minutes. But that's how long the video is. You don't really count how long it takes to remember your password, get logged into the system, and mm -hmm. then practice that skill after you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Because um, I just, there was a, the recent time study I did was learning Canva. So Canva's videos are broken down into one to three minute segments. And I was like, ah, this is minute 30 seconds. It's not going to take long. 13 minutes later, I had actually finished it. And remembering passwords is a thing, people. And it mm -hmm. can take time. Built it in. All those little extra things that you don't think about, yeah, that you're spending your time mm -hmm. on. And you wonder, I wonder a lot myself, where did the day go? Yeah. I, I needed to do this and this and this, but I did this and this, and that really, <laughs> that's all. Yeah, it couldn't have been that couldn't have been. And then you, th if you really think about, well, I had to do this prep work first to do the thing, and then this follow up, and then someone else emailed me with another follow up, and that made it take even more time. And yeah, and and yeah, it's a thing. Yeah, and then well, you might. Oh, Do sorry. I want to know the, that I about this? No. <laughs> but it's life. It's how things work. Yeah. yeah. And you might find that the things you've always done every day are not as important as they once were. Mm -hmm. So like asking yourself, what took the most time and was this actually necessary? And because that's how habits change is to understand what your day to day actually looks like and just realistically really ask yourself is this what my life should be right now is this what the library should be focused on is this important anymore is there something new that should take its place and start making that agreement at all levels of the organization to say this is what needs to change this is why build an agreement and say this is why we're actually tracking our time. It's not because you did anything wrong or because I don't trust you. It's because I don't trust the way that things have always been done. I don't trust that that is supposed to be true anymore. Let's change this. a better way to do it. And you just need yeah. to dig down to figure out if there is. You yeah. might end up coming up with the answer that actually it did work. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. have been doing do still work, but you may discover changes needed. Yeah. yeah. And also, if you're going to even temporarily include training and skills development, you might need to change things temporarily. And just say, we're going to give ourselves a month or two to learn this stuff. Our schedule is going to go haywire, but this is how we're going to do it. Rip off the Band-Aid and give it a try. So on the right hand side here are a series of tools that are all, it's all online based. So whether or you are in person, you are still working remotely, these tools will work. So Toggle is an actual time tracker and it has a project management component. The time tracker is free, it's going to be free. The project management has a free tier and a paid tier. So even if you just wanna use it for time tracking, Toggle is a good way to go. Um, near and Far, um, he's the, wrote, the guy who wrote this book. He also wrote Hooked and He's just good people. Um, he put together a series of tools that will help with distraction, time blocking, figuring out where to put your time and making kind of a promise with yourself to actually do what you said you were gonna do. It's harder than it looks. And there's also some tips and tricks for using a Google Calendar so that once you've figured out what which skills you actually need, what's most relevant, and you say, I'm going to spend five minutes on this task. The next step is where in your actual day are you going to fit this five minutes? 
because it is easy to tell yourself that you're going to spend this time, but it's harder to actually do it and hold yourself accountable and change those habits and make it a thing. So add it to a calendar, set calendar reminders, start training your brain to know that this is now a thing. And so Outlook Tasks works similarly to Google Calendar. Basically pick your tool of choice and figure out how you can add little mini tasks and reminders to it and start training yourself like a puppy. That's how I did it. It hurt, but it worked. And the Kanban board is, so Miro is this awesome mind mapping tool and planning tool, and it helps you build little cards for tasks, and it's great for team collaboration, and you can build out little learning tasks and say, um, I need to learn Google Docs so that we can start sharing things more easily. Um, these are the little mini subtasks that we need to learn. Uh, let's make one little mini card for each one. This is who's going to be learning it. This is when we're going to do it. Mark off a little checkbox when you're done. And once everything from the left side of the Kanban board gets checked off is done and shifts over to the right, you know you succeeded. It feels good to have everything shift to the right. I love checking things off of lists or crossing things off of lists. <laughs> yeah. And this is basically the visual list. It mm -hmm. just says, you did good. And Trello also has a Kanban board built into it and project management tools. Uh, Trello has been around for a while. You may have already heard about it. Some of you may already use it. So this is just a good way to track what needs to get done, when are you going to do it, why are you doing it. Let's do this thing. So when you are actually learning stuff, it helps to actually figure out where you're going to learn this from and what is it going to look like once you've learned it. So a lot of times in libraries and across nearly every single organization, uh, you'll, you have this tendency to send out a tutorial and you'll say, learn Microsoft Word, go to GCF Learn and start doing your thing. But then you actually get to GCF Learn and you start asking yourself questions. You open up these, this first tutorial and say, OK, I learned how to create a new document and do basic editing. OK, I learned how to start cutting and pasting and shifting stuff around. What am I going to use this stuff? Why is this practical? There are 45 tutorials on this page. Which, one, which ones are actually relevant to me? You sent me this link. Do you want me to learn all of them? Um, if I go, sure, I'll take these 45 different tutorials, but do the matter? Did I just waste my time? Did I waste your time? Did I time track for no reason and I'm never going to use this stuff? So start building out a chart. You can put in your main skill set on the left hand side, you're going to be taking Excel classes. You need it because in the library every month you need to do monthly reports. To be able to show to be able to use this practically, all you need to do is edit and add cells. You're going to need to be able to sort data based on different fields. And you need to be able to format this and print it so that we can put it into our budgeting and reporting archives. And so now you need to know that you can find the tutorials that will let you do this. And then to practice, do the thing. Gain access to the information and tools. And if you're actually able to do it, that's what success looks like. Mm -hmm. If you are learning Canva and you need to be able to do marketing, if you've ever gone to Canva's website, they have 8 billion and one different tutorials. <laughs> if you send someone over to Canva and say, hey, learn Canva, we're going to do a thing. It's overwhelming. And it's, it's asking too much of people to say, to just send over a random link and ask people to do it. Build an agreement. Where is this actually used? Which of these do I actually need to know? And then once you have this understanding, start chunking it. So you can actually start, most of the resources you're going to run into are not going to be chunked to your liking. 
you might only have 15 minutes or a half hour or an hour that's available in your day. And you might start, you might start looking at these different resources and say, I can't use this. This is an hour long tutorial. I can't use this. This is 45 tutorials and I don't know what I actually need. So then you start building this chart. And this is a link to a template that will send you over to this Canva template if you want to use it, or just go into Google Docs or Microsoft Word, build a chart, that's basically all it is. And you would just put in your task over here, and then you'd say, did I actually do it? And then you'd say, if you didn't do it, what went wrong? Or where did you actually have troubles in learning this? What do you want to practice more before you actually start using it? What additional materials and support do you need beyond this random tutorial that we sent to? And this is where you would put the tutorial source so that you can refer back to it just in case you need it. And it's also a quick link so that you can start measuring your track. Your track. And so let me click this. And I'm going to open up this version. And I'll do just a quick template of what this will actually look like. So I'm going to open up GCF Learn. It's the most common one that people are going to use. Or it's the most common one people have used. I can't say it's the only one that you're ever going to need. But if you open up, the technology section and go into Microsoft Excel. Now you have a series of tutorials that you want to start chunking out. So this is actually where you would start building that agreement and just start transferring everything over into that chart and say, and start working with your supervisor, working with the um, department lead or whoever is actually using this and telling you that you need to know this. And say so you need to get done with one, three, five, and six. This is what you need to know. If you wanna be able to move on to this next project, fill in with three, four, and seven. And then all it is is just task, I done did it, what went wrong? And so it is 10.52. Let me get through the rest of this here. And I'll say if anybody has any questions, um, anything you want to know more about, anything you want um, Amanda to dig down into more about, uh, go ahead and type into your question section of the GoToWebinar interface and she can answer those questions. Um, we gave you the link to the page for the <clears throat> tech class, um, but we'll, we'll also have a link to these slides as well with all her those links that she's got built into there. So you'll have that as available as well afterwards yeah. with the archive, just wanna let everyone know. And if anyone has actually used some of these different resources, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, because, like yeah. Resources. Absolutely. And I've gotten some emails recently about people who use the high-tech resources. So that was kind of awesome to hear. Nice. So if you start cycling through and using some of this stuff, I'd love to actually build out some more use cases, find out what works for people, what didn't work for people, and just start improving things along the way. So to wrap this out here, I'm just going to open up this here. And I'm going to give you just kind of a little primer on how this is organized and how I'm probably going to shift it and change it so that it works better for you all. But everything is broken down into smaller subsections so that you're able to do a quick reference to be able to access any of this stuff here. Uh, what I want to show you right now is this section right here. So I'm going to scroll down to this one here and kind of give you an idea of how to actually use these partnership frameworks. 
So these frameworks were actually put together by larger organizations. They're either by libraries themselves or they're by organizations who have used this quite a bit. So as you are starting to run through this process, life is easier if you just go here. Mm -hmm. And we'll click this open here. So most of these, you can actually adapt them and start using them just directly. You can start building out like a little shared document in either Google Docs or Microsoft Word to start figuring out what partnerships actually look like in your own library. And you can start converting what people have already done to what is actually feasible for you to do. Uh, we went over the user experience research for small to medium libraries. The World Health Organization is giant, and you don't actually have to do all of this stuff. You can check off um, the most important things to you in your library and start prioritizing what you will practically actually do when you're going to do it and start building a partnership chart as well. So you got those organizational tools and time management tools for skill building and learning, but you can also apply them to partnership building because you can break these little mini sections and subsections out into a calendar chart so that you know exactly when you're going to research this stuff, when you're going to use it, and how you're going to incorporate time management habits to build partnerships along with skill building because partnerships take time. I'm learning that right now. Partnerships take time. <laughs> and so this is just something that you can start baking into your everyday. And because partnerships have a tendency to go by a wayside, just like, just like skill building. And um, one easier one to start breaking this one out into is probably either this infographic chart or the master resource that it actually came from. This is where it came from. Break it out, time management, give it a try. That's not everything you're going to need to know about partnerships and skill building, but it's a quick primer to get you started. And if there are not any questions, that's about all I have for you, and we can call it good. I don't see any questions popping in just yet, but I'll give you a minute just in case. Oh, we do actually want to just come in on the question section that I can see. Um, okay. hmm, good, good question. How often should you be doing surveys? Like, so, I guess maybe repeating them to get updated information potentially. And it depends on a survey for what? Is it a survey to find out did this thing that I'm doing work or is it a survey to find out what people actually need? And surveys are not always the best way to do it because you can ask people what do you want to learn, but if people don't know that a tool exists, if they don't know that Excel will solve their problem, a survey is not going to help you. A survey is not learning and it's not going to be informational to say, this is your problem. These are the tools and resources that can help. Do you want to learn these tools and resources? But if you survey to say, what is the problem area that is most important to you? That'll mm -hmm. help more. But another way to do it besides surveying is using card sorting, or you can use a variety of the different uh, UX tools so that people actually have a brain, like a starting point and a brainstorming point to actually know what will actually help them. And then with that information, learn what will help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I remember this was talked about in one, maybe both of the previous sessions in this series about, uh, yeah, asking the right question. Not yeah. what do you want to learn, but what is your problem? Which sounds bad. I don't mean what is your problem, but <laughs> yeah. what kind of things are you struggling with or what would you wish you knew more about or something like that? Yeah. 
Um, but how often should you update yeah. that kind of? I mean, you got to yeah, you know, obviously yeah, yeah, something. How often you know would you suggest a library do a new ask of that information? As often as possible. Um, <laughs> so, so an ongoing yeah. survey or an ongoing you know yeah. comment form or something that you just are always gathering info. Yeah, and so you can, and that is also why I included question tracking in here because you can act you don't actually always have to do an individual survey to find this out mm -hmm. if you start um, tracking which questions come into your library and start tracking what people ask for even if you weren't immediately able to help mm -hmm. then you can start using that data to find out what people actually need Trend. and just yep. yeah and just automatically you're going to be figuring that out and instead of doing traditional surveys, you can also do, you can start doing one-on-one -on -one reference interviews. So you can start incorporating these using mini questions when you are, when people come in either for other things or to start learning a device. <clears throat> start, it, start adding one question at the end that just starts asking what's most important to you right now, what matters to you. And there's also, let me open up this worksheet that I just put together that I'm going to be adding now. Well, not right now, but <laughs> later today. So these are some questions that you can start asking yourself to make sure that you are actually choosing the right problem. And this is, instead of a traditional survey, you can start gathering this information from various different resources to find out, oh, this is the wrong one, sorry. I want my UX research guiding questions here. So this is what you wanna know from people. Instead of asking, what do you wanna learn or what do you need? Ask uh, what stresses yep, you out. I, yes, yep. And the top priorities is going to help you build out those bubbles to find out which bubble is biggest for people. And just how do you feel about work situations, school, life? Um, a surprising number of people have a problem with um, transportation and transit mm -hmm. or being able to gain access to um, bus route information in different languages. Mm -hmm. And so start if you do surveys, maybe try one that's a little closer to this to find out, to kind of dig deeper into guiding yourself toward the right problem area, even if it isn't toward a specific tool. That may have been a touch of a long-winded answer. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> no, it is a thanks, yeah. It's yeah. <clears throat> good tips, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, and someone did ask about getting having access to all these documents. And as Amanda just mentioned, yeah, these are all off of that. Um, everything she's showing you is available to you to use uh, off of that uh, the teaching technology course page. And this one, I actually think I just added yesterday. Let me double check before I say that I did. Yes, I did. Um, what I do need to add is a download link. I added download links to most of these, but it looks like I missed this one because it was getting to the end of the day. But were there any other... Oh, and the resource, if you were looking for the uh, framing the problem, the one sentence pitch Mad Libs, are available here. This is the Canva template that'll let you use this thing. And I will also share out these slides if you want to grab it from here. And do we have any other questions that came in? 
Um, let's see, I can get this over here. I don't see anything. You know, if anybody has any questions, yes, we're a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. We started a little after 10. And um, as any of you may know who attend our show here regularly, we um, go as long as it takes to answer any questions you all may have. So um, if you do have anything <clears throat> you want to ask of Amanda right now, get it into the question section. Otherwise, you, you guys do know where to find her. <laughs> um, just double checking here to see. No, no. And my contact info is at the end here. I don't remember why I made that red, but I'll take it. <laughs> Readability? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't see any questions coming in. I can't see if you guys are typing like in some. Uh, oh, like a little chat. Yeah. Yeah. I have to wait until it pops up, but um, doesn't look like anybody has any desperate questions right now. That's fine. Um, you guys, as I said, you all, you all know where to find Amanda. So um, thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for this. I think it's um, great tips in helping to, you know, make things less stressful and creating this kind of thing. And I know people always talk about we need to do have more partnerships and work with other people. And how do you get started with something that huge? And I think this is a lot of good resources. Yeah. Um, uh, are um, in the session here. So thank you. Um, and as I said, I'm going to actually, I'm going to pull presenter control to my screen so I can show you all. Go for there it. Go. All right. So this is a session page for today's show uh, where there is a link here that goes right to the tech technology course that uh, Amanda has been showing you. Uh, go in here. It's out there. It's free and available for everyone, anyone who wants to, to go through all these modules, uh, links to everything that uh, Amanda mentioned here and that she showed you are all in here. Um, we will also be sending you, um, I already put into there, but here's the the slides that she just she used today that do have links in them as well to various things. So that will be included when we get the recording up as well. Uh, we do have, as I said, this is a four-part series. The first two parts have been done, and we have links here to those recordings if you do want to go and watch those, um, if you haven't already. And then the fourth part of this will be in two weeks on July 28th, marketing and follow-up. So uh, come back in two weeks to uh, learn about how to make sure everybody knows you're doing all these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're in the home stretch, people. Yeah, yeah. I will mention while we're looking at this here, um, and if you look at our full Encompass Live uh, schedule here, usually the last Wednesday of the month is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. You can see I've got a couple of them set up here for the next couple of months. I'm waiting for working through this first, then we'll get the topics for those. But usually the last Wednesday of the month is always Pretty Sweet Tech. That's when Amanda comes on the show and talks to us about anything tech related. Uh, so you can always plan for that every month. Uh, this month's Pretty Sweet Tech in July is the fourth part of the Teaching Technology in the Library series. So there is no Pretty Sweet Tech this month. There's part four. Um, still Amanda. <laughs> uh, that's just part of this special series. Oh, should be back with something new next month. We'll see. Yeah. So I mentioned the archive, we have Ren recording the show. Here underneath our list of upcoming shows is the link to our archives where you see all of our previous ones. And here's the one from last week where we put a link to the recording and a link to the slides. Uh, same thing will be for today's show. I will um, have it there, it'll be at the top of the list here. Uh, everyone um, should have it up here and ready uh, for you to view or to share by the end of the day tomorrow, hopefully. Um, as long as YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me, that usually works out. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the archive is available. Um, we also post it to our various social media. We um, use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Oh, well. uh, we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live all over here. Um, it is this linked off of our Facebook or 
pages here. See, there's a link to it there on this session page. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We um, put reminders as a reminder to log into today's show, recording of the previous show. So um, we have all of that information here on our website. Otherwise, look for the hashtag we use for the show, NCUMPLIVE, a little abbreviation, when we um, post anything. So when our recording is available, that is will be announced on there as well. While we're here on the archives, I will show you there is a search feature here. So you can search our show archives. You want to look for a particular topic, see if we've done a show about something. You can do the full archives or just look at the most recent 12 months if you want just current information. Um, that's because this is the show, the full archives for the um, entire history of Encompass Live. I won't scroll all the way down. You can see this is a long page, but Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we are going on. Um, 12 some odd years of the show. Uh, so just pay attention when you do watch a show on the original broadcast date. Uh, we have the date here on everyone, so you can tell when it actually happened. Um, many of our shows will stand the text of time and will still be valid and useful, but some things may be old. Um, resources may have changed, information may have changed about something, uh, services and product might no longer exist anymore, links might be broken or not out there at all um, for very old things, but um, we will always keep all of our archives here. That's one thing that librarians and libraries do is keep historical information available. So as long as we have a place to host them, they'll always be there, but just pay attention when you are um, looking in our archives. That wraps up for today. Um, next week, you know, two weeks from now, come back for part four with Amanda and teaching technology in the library marketing and follow up. But next week, our topic is accessing census data. Um, Blanca Ramirez Salazar will be with us. She is from the Census Bureau and she's going to talk about um, the 2020 census that just wrapped up and they have the data for, from and how you can use it and access it and how librarians can work with all that data that's out there now. So if you're looking for um, demographic information for working on surveys or figuring out what you need to do or um, community planning or anything, um, this is definitely a session you want to sign up for and learn how to use all that great census data that has been gathered. And please do sign up for any of our other talk shows we have coming up over the next few months. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you again, Amanda. And uh, we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.